I'm looking at a log here from Lucky13 from Greece. Uh, Lucky13 was submitted his log and was included in the last live stream that I did. Uh, but uh, <laughs> there were two files with the same name, and I looked at the wrong one and went, huh, isn't that interesting? Two people having the exact same problem in one week. Well, there you go. Uh, so I, Lucky13 has submitted a new file, which I'm going to now look at. Uh, and those of you who are thinking, wait a minute, this isn't a live stream. No, you're right, this isn't a live stream. I have a pretty big backlog here. Oh, that's not it. This is it. I have a pretty big backlog here, and I have some travel coming up. Uh, and so I can't really live stream from the road, so I'm going to try and get some of this stuff done uh, just with the normal old style videos. Oh, remember how it used to be? Yeah, well, anyway. So let's take a look at Lucky 13's uh, log. I've got it loaded up here. And Lucky 13, you were just asking for general tuning advice. And the first thing that I'm going to do, right, which is what I almost always do at the beginning of a log, is I'm going to look at the gyros. And I'm going to look at the gyros to determine how much vibration your copter is experiencing. Excess vibration gets in the way of everything. It just makes the copter harder to tune, makes it fly worse, whereas a copter that has very little vibration is going to fly better and be easier to tune. And I'm going to do that by uh, bringing up the gyro traces and then zooming all the way out to 10% and looking at the thickness of the lines. The, the gyro will wiggle and squiggle back and forth with this vibration, and the more vibration there is, the thicker the line will look when you zoom all the way out because zooming all the way out compresses all the little wiggles and squiggles into one sort of thick line. Now, the black box viewer that we're using has smoothing built in. And the idea is that sometimes it's kind of hard to see the forest for the trees, if that phrase makes any sense to you. So we're going to filter the lines and smooth them out and get rid of some of the high frequency noise. That doesn't really affect anything. But for in this case, we don't want that. We don't want the smoothing. And so what I could do is I could manually go through and I could change the smoothing to zero. But that's tedious and I'm not going to do that. I'm going to hit cancel on that. There's a keystroke in Black Box Explorer, uh, in Betaflight Black Box Explorer, which by the way is what I'm using, not Clean Flight Black Box Explorer, which has essentially not been developed for a while. There's a keystroke in here that turns off the smoothing automatically, and it's a very useful keystroke. It is the S key, S as in Sam, S as in smoothing. I'm going to press it now, and you'll see the lines will get a little thicker so with smoothing, without, with, without. And so in this case, you can see there's there's not that much difference. And there's also, the lines are very thin, which tells us that we don't have a lot of noise. This copter is relatively noise-free. And that's good. That means we have the freedom to kind of tune it. We, we may have a little more flexibility to increase the degain, or maybe if we want to change the filtering, that's all stuff we can do. Notice, by the way, that when I press the S key to turn smoothing on and off, down here in the bottom uh, pane of the window, the bottom bar or whatever, as I do it, 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 that appears and disappears. That's just a way of reminding us what's going on here. Now, another thing I want to check with this black box log is, notice that we've got, this is the Calibri race target. So perhaps this is a TBS power cube, which is one flight controller that uses that target. And we're running it at an 8K gyro rate which is probably the fastest it can run. Only race flight goes above 8, 8K as far as I know. But our PID loop is running at 2K, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with an 8K, 2K rate. I typically will run on my F3 boards at 8K, 4K. And the idea there, I don't actually think there's much advantage in my testing. I don't see any advantage of going from 2K to 4K. But I figure, you know, ah, if, if you could do it, why not go a little faster? So then why don't I run at 8K, 8K? And the reason for that is that, uh, with especially with Betaflight 3.0, it's so processor intensive that I don't find that F3 boards can reliably run at 8K PID loop rate. So I go 8K, 4K, I don't have any processor utilization issues, and I'm good to go. Uh, running at 2K may be important if, however, you are using OneShot. So let's take a look here in the header. And we can see that, in fact, we are using OneShot 125. If you're using OneShot 125, I would suggest running 8K 2K. And the reason for that is that the motor update for one OneShot, technically it can go up to 4K if you short calibrate your throttle channels, your, your motor outputs. But that's something I don't, I'm not sure there's much advantage to it. 
and uh, it's a little bit iffy, you can get yourself in a situation where you have desyncs, basically. It's not really technically a desync. It's a miscommunication between the flight controller and the ESC, but it'll look like a desync. So I don't recommend running one shot at, at above. Uh, you could run it at 2.6K, but just run it at 2K and, and you'll be fine. So I think 8K, 2K is the best setup here, assuming that the ESCs you're using don't run multi-shot. Now, what ESCs are you using? Mm, da, 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 da. You say you're using BL Heli 14.7. So that tells me because you're running a BL Heli 14 version that you're running standard BL Heli ESCs, not BL Heli S. And that means that you may not be able to run multi-shot unless you jump through some hoops. You'll have to flash a custom firmware that may not be worth the trouble. So, okay, so 8K, 2K is, is a good place for your PID loop and your gyro to be. I noticed that your black box sample rate is 1 over 4. And that actually, I don't think, is as good as it could be. You're, if you've got a 2K PID loop rate and then you're sampling at 1 over 4, that means you're sampling at 250 hertz. And uh, is that right? No, 500 hertz. Sorry, <laughs> math is hard. You're running at 500 hertz. And the problem with that is that there, with your Nyquist limit, which is the maximum frequency that you can reliably record, is half of that. So if you're sampling at 500 hertz, your Nyquist limit is 250 hertz. And as we know, uh, if we look at the spectral data, let's bring up the spectrum analyzer here since we've got one. If we look at the spectral data, we can see, uh, no, this isn't, sorry, this isn't going to work because, <laughs> because this is after the sampling. Uh, sorry, I would need an, an unfiltered gyro trace. I don't have that. Never mind. Uh, if we were to see the unfiltered spectral data, we would see that there is data, there's, there is, there are, is energy up above 250 hertz. So if we were only capturing up to 250 hertz, uh, then we're missing out on potentially important data that we might use to tune the notch filter or something else. I ideally want to log at no slower than one kilohertz. A logging rate of one kilohertz means your Nyquist frequency, your Nyquist limit is 500 hertz. And by 500 hertz, most of, there's not a lot of strong energy on most of our copters. And so we're getting most of the useful data that we, we want to get about the, the frequency, the frequency information. So, okay, but if you're running on a Calibri race, I don't know if that has an onboard data flash chip or not, but perhaps you're using an open log. Is that something I can see here in the header? Hold on. I'm not sure that it is. It would be nice if it was. Uh, black, I can see that you're using black box, obviously, but I don't see what your black box device is. So fine. Uh, let's, you might be using an open log device. And in that case, especially with Betaflight 3.0, you used to be able to log at one kilohertz pretty reliably, especially if you disabled the accelerometer. But with Betaflight 3.0, some people are having to go down to 500 hertz because even with an open log device because the serial port can't keep up with all the data that Betaflight is trying to log. So I would say try going to a logging rate of one kilohertz. Uh, if possible, if you don't get too many breakups, your black box information will be a little more useful. But let's take a look at what you've got anyway and see what we can see. So your copter is noise-free and clean. And then let's bring up the PIDs for, let's just start with the roll axis, why not? Now, again, I'm going to turn smoothing off. And again, notice there's not that much difference between them. So that's fine. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at your, and there we go. I'm going to look at your P term trace, which is the red one. And I'm going to look especially at scenarios where you go to high throttle. Now you notice you're at very high throttle here, but the P term trace is not really very active. So you don't have a lot of high throttle oscillations. The P term trace is relatively close to the zero line is what I'm saying. Whereas here we can see the P term trace starts to get more active. And the reason for that is probably that as you drop the throttle, the copter enters a more unstable aerodynamic situation. Um, I don't know, maybe uh, the copter starts to fall through its own prop wash perhaps, and the P term gets more active. We can see that the D term is approximately proportional to the P term. In other words, in magnitude, they're oftentimes roughly similar. We don't see the D term really flipping out and, and, and being much more active than the P term. 
And that, in general, I would say that that's probably a good thing. However, especially with Betaflight 3.0 and the new Black Box Explorer, I don't know what's changed. But sometimes I look at these logs and the D-Term seems super active, really noisy, but the copter's flying great. And so I'm no, I don't feel confident in my ability to assess your D-Term just by looking at your black box log. If your D-Term was just ridiculously over the top noisy, then I would say, okay, well, that's, that's probably not good. But I've seen traces where the D-Term looked pretty noisy to me. And I, and yet, like, for example, here, we can see very strong D-Term oscillations here, right? The P-Term and the D-Term are oscillating. Uh, what's happened? You've dropped your throttle. The copter is falling. And as you raise the throttle. So here during this fall, we had these oscillations. Uh, but I would think that, especially because you're at low throttle, these oscillations are probably not very strong. They're not manifesting as anything bad because the throttle set point is so low at this point that the motors are just not acting very strongly. We can see that the motors are, are sort of moving, but they're overall at a very low level. So I, I, I feel like if you're, you know, if your motors are coming down cool, then that should be the primary determinant of whether your D gain is, ex is acceptable or not. Uh, and then look at the black box log and see what it looks like. But like I said, I've seen cases where the motors were coming down moderately warm, but not hot. I felt like it was a fine tune and the black box log looked really bad, but there you go. You got to let the flight characteristics dictate the tune. We see some activity here in the P term. The P term is, I, I see things like this and I, this is what I like to see. The P term is getting active. It's going up and down. It's getting active. It's not just sort of sitting there doing nothing. Um, and that tells me that, that it's, it's sort of working, but it's not oscillating hard. I don't see any cases here where there's what looks like a hard sinusoidal P term oscillation. It suggests to me that your P gain maybe could stand to be raised. But again, it's a little hard to tell without flight video. We'll take a look at your pitch axis next. Scrolling through here, I'm just looking to get a general sense of how active the pitch axis is and if any, any, anything jumps out like hard oscillations. And again, we see a few times here where the pitch axis gets a little messy. But overall, nothing crazy here. Well, that, that's that's a little. I'd be curious what you're doing here when the pitch axis gets really messy. This is the second time I've seen it. You see how the P term is just kind of all over the place, getting kind of messy. You're at full throttle. You drop the throttle. You're turning, and then you raise the throttle hard. Maybe that is some kind of prop wash scenario, um, in which case perhaps raising the D gain would be a thing that would help with that. And in your yaw axis. Your yaw axis, mostly what I'm looking for in the yaw axis is that I don't see excess signs, signs of excess P gain, really strong P term oscillation. And we can see that this P term line is not, is not going up, down, up, down, all over the place. So again, your yaw gain is not too bad. Let's take a look at the PIDs here. Um, The pits look pretty normal. I feel like your D gains are much lower than I would have them. Uh, that is that is on pitch and roll. Yaw D gain you can ignore. There there isn't any D gain on yaw. I don't, that doesn't belong there. But you're, you, these are very close to your defaults. And since you have a relatively noise free copter, my inclination would be to work the D gain up. I find with Betaflight 3.0 that if I raise the D gain, the prop wash handling usually gets better. And I can raise the D gain all the way to the point pretty much where the motors start to get warm on, on the copters I've tuned anyway. I can raise the D gain pretty much to the point where the motors start getting warm the, and the, the prop wash handling and everything gets better. Um, and then eventually the motors start to get warm or even hot and I have to stop. But it almost feels like the, the it used to be if you raise the D gain too high, you would get these D term oscillations, these kind of cricket sounding oscillations. Um, but the, you would get that point before the motors started getting hot. And for whatever reason, these days, the D-term seems to be, whatever Boris has done under the hood, it seems to be working very well right up to the point where the motors get hot. 
So I would try, if you feel like your P gains are where you want them to be, and you know, if you feel like the copter is handling sharply, and then I would try raising the D gain and raise it to maybe 35 or even 40. Uh, always when you're testing with the D gain, do a short flight, a 30 second or a 45 second flight at most, uh, and, and, you know, do some sharp turns to kind of bring out the D term action, right? Don't just hover because the D, D gain isn't, D term isn't going to do very much during the hover, but just very quickly do some sharp turns and bring out the D, D term, uh, activity and then land quickly and see if your motors are hot. Because anytime you raise your D gain, you have the potential to raise it to the point where you get, where you smoke a motor, uh, if it's too high. But your copter is very noise free and so I don't think that's much of a risk. Uh, and I think you might be able to get better prop wash handling uh, and better stops at the end of flips and rolls if you were to raise that. So there, those are my thoughts. Hope they're helpful. Happy flying.